Good evening, everyone, and welcome to our online event celebrating International Women's Day, hosted by Abney Park Trust. Just as some initial housekeeping, if you're experiencing any problems with audio or video, please let us know in the chat box on the right hand side. I'm Holly Spice and I'm the Deputy Chair of Abney Park Trust, and I'll be giving a short introduction to this main event. First off, thanks to everyone who has bought a ticket for tonight's event, and thanks also to the people who have worked hard to put the event together, including our staff members, Zach and Hayden, as well as volunteers on the events committee. The Trust is a registered charity working to promote Abney Park. We work in partnership with the London Borough of Hackley to maintain the park both for the local community of today and for the future. As the Trust, we're responsible for monument restoration, grave searches, managing archival material, hosting events such as walking tours, and providing information about the history of the cemetery and those buried here, as well as the changing biodiversity of the park. And all of this can be found on our website, abneypark.org. It's been almost a year now since we've been able to run in-person events as a result of the coronavirus pandemic, and this was one of our main ways of raising revenue. Whilst we've adapted to running successful online talks such as this evening's, we find that we continue to need your support. So if you are able to spare a little extra to help us out, please do visit our website, abneypark.org, and click on the donate button at the top. We spend donations on our important work by putting on events like these, looking after monuments and much more. We have a busy event schedule this month, so if you do enjoy tonight's event, check out Alan Gartrell's online talk on Abney Park's MPs, taking place on Thursday the 18th of March, and tickets are on donation. And on Wednesday the 31st of March, join poet and writer Chris McCabe as he shares his findings from his forthcoming book, Buried Garden, which documents the lost poets of Abney Park Cemetery, and tickets are priced at £6. And now for this evening's event. The theme for this year's International Women's Day is Choose to Challenge. I am delighted to introduce Romney Reagan and Sam Perrin, who will pay homage to the fearless women interred in Abney Park Cemetery. Pioneers who ripped up the rule books and whose stories are inspiring, surprising and poignant. We hope you enjoy. Romney, Sam, over to you. Hello and welcome to our Women of Abney Park Cemetery tour. Your tour guides today will be myself, Romney Reagan, and Sam Perrin. I am a cemetery historian um, and I have been since 2003 and I'm delighted to be working with Romney as part of Doyens of Death. We are the Doyens of Death Cemetery Tour Guiding Duo and we are Victoriana with Brass Knuckles. Now we're going to begin our Women of Abney Park Cemetery tour, and the first woman on our tour today isn't actually buried here, but she's incredibly important to our Women of Abney story because she's lived and died right where we are standing. Her name is Lady Mary Abney. Lady Abney was born Mary Gunston in 1676. In the year 1700, at the age of just 24, she married the 60-year-old Sir Thomas Abney, he was the principal founder of the Bank of England, and he was Lord Mayor of London in the year they were married, so that might have had something to do with it. But when they first got married, they didn't live here yet. They lived actually 10 miles north of here and what's now Waltham Cross. And it was that estate where they befriended the famous hymn writer Isaac Watts. So Isaac Watts, his statue was actually featured in the center of Abney Park Cemetery because he lived with the Abneys for 36 years. But I'm not focusing on him for this story because this is the women of Abney Tour. In 1701, just one year into Mary's marriage to Sir Thomas, Mary's brother dies, leaving the manor of Stoke Newington, as it was then called, to her. But due to marriage laws at that time, the manor passed to her husband instead of her. But despite not officially owning the house herself outright, Mary renovated the manor to suit her tastes and ideas, and she renamed it Abney House. While they didn't live here full time, the family did frequently come down to Abney House because it was closer to London. Mary designed in the planting and the landscaping of Abney Park herself, and it's said that Isaac Watts' hymn writing was inspired by walking through the park that she had created. Mary's husband died in 1722 when she was 46 years old, and as a widow, she was now a free woman. One benefit of this, which was quite rare for that time, was she took over the estate lease of Abney House and Abney Park and all of its tenants in her own right, and she became Lady of the Manor. Fourteen years after she became a widow, in 1736, Mary moved the whole household down to live at Abney House full-time. She was joined by her unmarried daughter Elizabeth and, of course, Isaac Watts. 
The area of Stoke Newington at this time was nonconformist. Famous dissenter author Daniel Defoe lived just down the road on Church Street. Lady Abney had many dissenters and independent activists in her friend group, and one of the most prominent of her friends was Selina Hastings, who was the Countess of Huntington. Selina sponsored the abolitionist and activist Gustavus Vasa, also known as Uladu Mukwainu, when he came to Britain. Vasa was active among leaders of the anti-slave trade movement in the 1780s. He published his autobiography with financial backing from Lady Abney's friend Selina, which depicted the horrors of slavery. His book went through nine editions in his lifetime and helped to pass the British Slave Trade Act in 1807, which abolished the slave trade. Ikuyanu married an Englishwoman named Susanna Cullen in 1792, and they had two daughters, one of whom, Joanna Vasa, is buried right here in Abney Park. Lady Abney died in 1750 at the age of 73. She's buried near her brother just down the road next door at St. Mary's Old Church by Clissold Park. And it's interesting that she chose to have her body buried here in her community of Stoke Newington, which she cared for so much, rather than with her late husband. After Lady Abney's death, her daughter Elizabeth inherited the manor and park, and she managed the estate like her mother before her. Elizabeth died unmarried and independent in 1782. In her will, she directed that her estates be sold and all the proceeds given to dissenter charities. Abney Manor passed through a few hands until in the 1830s, when it was purchased by the cemetery company to become the fourth garden cemetery in the Magnificent Seven. In keeping with the community of Stoke Newington, the cemetery is unconsecrated and fully non-denominational. Everyone from any faith or belief system, or lack thereof, is welcome here. Something that Lady Mary would have been very happy to know. Abney Park Cemetery opened for burial in 1840, and this was long before the creation of the great Victorian parks of London. Clissold Park, down the road in Stoke Newington Church Street, didn't open until almost 50 years after Abney Park opened. So for many years, Abney was the main public open space for the local community. Cemeteries were also one of the few spaces where unmarried women were allowed to go without a chaperone, so cemeteries provided freedom of movement for women in a socially accepted practice, which is quite interesting when you think that's also how Lady Abney got her power, who, being a widow, she was also allowed freedom of movement. Since women were to be found alone, there could also be courtship opportunities when men picked up on this, and I love the idea of women coming to the cemetery for the freedom of the gardens and staying to chat up a fella. Now that we've set the scene for how Abney Park came into being and what it's represented for its community, we are now ready for the first stop on our grave tour. Ethel's grave is, or Ethel Clary Haslam's grave is not, you have to keep an eye open for it. It's a very rough hewn stone carved cross. And very helpfully, it doesn't actually have her name on it, but it does have her family name being Haslam. So Ethel Clary Haslam is one of Abney Park's number of suffragettes. Before I tell you about her, I think it's important to utilise my favourite C word in history being context. To set the scene and using context, in the early 19th century, England was run by the wealthy elite. You had rich landowners, the aristocracy, you had mercantile and banking fat cats who bought their way into the ruling circle, and br corruption, bribery and nepotism were commonplace. So not like 2020 at all. So thanks in part to the residual memory of the reign of terror in France the previous century, democracy was considered a dirty word, and in England, only upper-class men were allowed to vote. Industrial cities like Manchester and Birmingham didn't have a single MP to represent them in Parliament prior to 1832. This disparity led for pressure to reform, and in 1832, the first of three reform acts was reluctantly passed in the hope of weeding out the rot that was deep-rooted within the government. But the act wasn't a magic bullet, and change was slow. The vote was granted to more wealthy and more property-owning men, but remained denied to middle and working class men. That same year, the first female suffrage petition was presented to Parliament by Yorkshire woman Mary Smith, who petitioned that she and other spinsters should, and I quote, have a vote in the election of members of Parliament. In 1866, reformer and MP John Stuart Mill presented the first mass suffragists petition to the Houses of, House of Commons, which contained the signatures of 1,500 women demanding the same political rights as men. By 1897, the National Union of Women's Suffrage Societies, or the NUWSS, united 17 societies and adopted a very non-confrontational approach. The organisation encouraged peaceful petitioning, but there was one problem. This accomplished nothing. Something needed to change. So in 1903, the Women's Social and Political Union, or the WSPU, formed in Manchester, the home of Emmeline Pankhurst, and in 1905 adopted the motto, Deeds Not Words. This was the beginning of militant action by the suffragettes. Now, just to distinguish, the suffragists were the suffragettes' older sisters from the 1860s onwards, whereby the suffragettes were the more militant version of their older sisters, but in the 20th century. At this point, enter Ethel Clarice Haslam. 
She was a member of the Rumford Board of Guardians and the Church League for Women's Suffrage. Ethel was also the secretary for the Ilford branch of the WSPU and managed to rack up a rather impressive record of five arrests over a four-year period. Her first arrest was on the 16th of November 1909, which followed a WSPU deputation to the House of Commons, but she was released the same day. On the 23rd of July 1910, the WSPU marched through Hyde Park in support of the Women's Conciliation Bill being debated in Parliament. Dressed as Boudicca, Ethel embodied the Iceni warrior queen's take-no-prisoners attitude that would later, and somewhat ironically, result in her incarceration on a further four occasions. Four months later, Ethel was arrested again on the 18th of November, following a day of violence meted out by the police against the protesting woman that became known as Black Friday. Ethel was released without charge, but many of her fellow suffragettes were kicked, punched and sexually assaulted, resulting in the suffragettes resorting to smashing windows and throwing stones. Four days later, the 22nd of November 1910, with the memories of Black Friday still fresh in the suffragettes' minds, Ethel and some of her companions made their way down to the home of a man by the name of John Burns. John Burns was the MP for Battersea and was also the president of the local government board which piloted the census bill in 1909. He was the suffragette's public enemy number one because he was a massive hypocrite. On one hand, as a cabinet minister, he denied women the vote. But as the president of the local government board, he begged the woman to comply with the census bill. So they ended up throwing stones through his windows. And as a result of going down and throwing stones at John Burns' window, Ethel and her friends were arrested and sentenced to 14 days in Holloway Prison. She was released thereafter. In April 1911, you had the census protest, and in March 1912, Ethel was arrested once again, this time part of the WSPU window-smashing campaign. On this occasion, she went down to Coventry Street in Piccadilly, and using her great-grandfather's hammer, she went to Lambert & Co., who were jewellers, and smashed every one of their windows in plain sight of all of the shop assistants. She ended up being sentenced to two months' hard labour in Holloway Prison again. Now, this is what I like about Ethel so much. She refused to do the hard labour. She refused to wear the prison clothes. In short, the suffragettes were forbidden from exercising with Emmeline Pankhurst, who was also incarcerated at the same time they were. And as a result of this mutiny broke out, Ethel decided to break 24 of her cell windows, which resulted in her being sentenced to two weeks in solitary confinement. And I have her words here. She said her cell, and I quote, was awfully damp and cold, and my bed was made of iron, very horrible to lay upon. Over the next few days, a hunger strike ensued and Ethel was force-fed, as were many of the women during that time. She reported hearing the doctors and wardresses making their way from cell to cell, making their way closer and closer to where she was, describing the scenario as they made enough noise to scare me. I imagined they were being massacred, for the howling was horrible. They brought a large chair into my cell. It was the most horrible and ghastly affair I had seen. I resisted as best I could, and four wardresses and a doctor put me into the chair. I entreated them not to be so cruel, but to no avail. They tied a sheet around my neck. One wardress held my hands, another my head, and another my nose while the doctor poured some food down my throat by means of a feeding cup. I had to swallow a pint of this stuff. It was the only time she was force-fed, and Ethel was released on the 5th of May that same year. Now, in 1913, she was arrested once more, which was for the particularly heinous crime of affixing a WSPU poster to a letterbox. Now, this time, her friends were quite frankly sick and tired of her being sent to prison. So very much against her will, they actually ended up posting her, um, or paying the fine rather, so she didn't have to go back to prison for, you know, the fifth time. Now, in 1914, she had a taste of her own medicine when a bunch of speakers at an open-air suffrage meeting sought refuge in her own home after being pelted with bottles and tomatoes and cans and everything else, and her own windows were actually broken during this. Now, one of the things I do really like about Ethel is that it seems that she took an awful lot of inspiration from her parents, in particular her father. On one of the many occasions she was arrested in her hometown for smashing a shopkeeper's windows, her father was presented, or rather posted, with a very threatening postcard saying, you'd better watch out, we're coming to get you, that sort of thing. Those aren't the exact words used, but it gives you a flavour of exactly what the person making the threats had said. He also had some very nasty things to say about the suffragettes themselves. And George Haslam responded in the, the classiest way, basically saying, fine, come down, smash my windows, I'm happy to do it on condition that the people who throw the stones accept the same punishment as the women are receiving for doing exactly the same thing. See, she had the absolute and utmost support of her parents, and I think that's absolutely fabulous, because that definitely shaped her. And I think, in addition to that, she obviously took on her father's very much defiant tone in terms of doing what was right. I mean, it's thanks to her that we now enjoy the vote. So yeah, ladies and gents, the next time you feel completely dissatisfied with politics, just bear in mind three words, Ethel Clarice Haslam. 
In fact, she was actually identified as one of the most hundred influential figures selected for the Suffrage Pioneers Project, which aims to identify and celebrate the unsung women and supportive men in the campaign for votes, basically to inspire a new generation of voters. A lot of this information you can find in Rise Up Women, The Remarkable Lives of the Suffragettes by Diane Atkinson, and I also highly recommend investing in The Life of Ethel Haslam and Ilford Suffragette by Pat Heron. Now here we are at the grave of Betsy Cudwallader, and what we can see in front of us now is a very beautiful green stone and a even more lovely green bench. Please feel free to take a little seat and I will tell you all about Betsy. Now, Betsy Cadwallader was pretty amazing. She'd been called the Forgotten Florence Nightingale, which is a bit funny, as I will tell you about their rather tense relationship in a bit. Betsy was born in 1789 near Bala, North Wales. She was one of 16 children, and her mother died when she was only five years old. Betsy got employed locally as a maid, where she learned housework, to speak English, and to play the triple harp. Her pursuit to the arts was impressive as she was a housemaid, and it was continued throughout her life, despite her grueling work. Now, Betsy was not happy in her hometown, though, and at the age of 14, she escaped through a bedroom window using tied sheeps like something in a film, and she left Bala. From there, she traveled to Liverpool, where she entered again into domestic service. Then, later, she returned to Wales, but then quickly fled again, this time to avoid marriage, opting instead to live with her sister in London. And it was here in London that she first encountered the theater, which she loved very much. In 1820, at age 31, she again returned to Bala, which by then she considered to be quite dull. And now, I don't know why she kept returning if she found it quite dull, but, you know, she did, and she did what she wanted. But, you know, after being a Wales for a second, she ran off one more time, this time to become a maid to a ship's captain, and she traveled for many years, visiting South America, Africa, and Australia. At times, she even performed Shakespeare on board the ship. Despite her stubbornness and her independence, Betsy herself claimed that in the course of her travels, she was proposed to by over 20 men. After acquiring nursing training, and at the age of 65, she joined the military nursing service with the intention of working in the Crimea, despite the attempts of her sister Bridget to dissuade her. Now, Florence Nightingale, who came from a privileged background, did not want the Welsh working class Betsy to go. She said that if Betsy wanted to go to the Crimea, it would be against her will, and that if Betsy would have to be made over to another superintendent. Now, Betsy being Betsy responded, do you think I am a dog or an animal to make me over? I have a will of my own. Florence Nightingale was a woman who believed in rules, regulations, and red tape, whereas Betsy took a more intuitive and flexible approach to her nursing. She fought for more power, but Florence prevented her from tending to soldiers and instead had her mending t-shirts and other menial tasks below her skill set. Betsy got frustrated and she left for Balclava, where she procured vital supplies such as parcels of food, clothing, medical supplies, and she made massive improvements in hygiene. She slept on a bare floor. She cooked and cleaned and nursed for 20 hours a day. This woman was tireless. These conditions, of course, in the Crimea eventually took their toll on Betsy's health. She did return to Britain in 1855, one year before the war ended. By then, she was suffering from cholera and dysentery. She lived in London, again at her sister's house, during which time she wrote her autobiography. She died in 1860, five years after her return, and was buried in a pauper's common grave with four others right where we're standing. In 2012, the Royal College of Nursing and the Welsh Health Board, that is actually named after Betsy, installed this bench and this headstone here to mark Betsy's final resting place and share her story with visitors to the cemetery. And I think what's also interesting about Betsy to mention as well is that she was buried in a common grave like so many people are buried in Abney, are not in marked graves. You don't have a stone and it's hard to locate where you're buried. Now, all these records, they were written down, but in 1974, there was a flood and obviously the cemetery was in administration. So a lot of these records were lost and archivists have been working tirelessly in the Abney Unearth Project to get names attached to locations. So with common graves has been such an issue. And it's really wonderful that the Welsh Health Board put this marker here for Betsy so that we can now come on audio tours and find where she's resting. Yes, just as a quick postscript to um, Romney's bit about Betsy, something that always amuses me and always puts this into context in terms of her influence and how much she contributed is that in 2014, the Western Mail had a survey for the 50 greatest Welsh people of all time. Betsy came 38th. In case you were wondering who she beat, she beat such Welsh luminaries as Tom Jones, Anthony Hopkins and Ivan Avila. Woo! Go <laughs> Betsy! Go Betsy. We love Betsy. Yeah, ladies and gents, don't be put off by the fact that you can't see a monument for Margaret Graham. Uh, she doesn't actually have one. She's up against the wall in an unmarked grave, in a common grave, which she shares with a number of strangers she never knew in life. 
I think the point of, to look out for, or the grave to look out for, has the surname of Nutta on the front. That is my point of reference, and she is somewhere behind that up against the wall. Okay, so the next stop on the tour is the fearless aeronaut called Margaret Graham. Now, Margaret was a young woman at the age of 16 when she took her first flight with future husband, George Graham. She really, really enjoyed the danger and the excitement of bouncing above the skyline of London, and very soon she excelled him at it. During the time of 1830 to 1850, Margaret took many, many flights, and she was unfortunately prone to a lot of criticism, as a lot of the women who we've spoken about on our tour often are, such as the case with pioneering women. That didn't hold her back, though. Margaret was an absolutely fantastic self-publicist, and when criticised, took to the media, i.e. the newspapers, vigorously to defend her reputation. She had a lot of male contemporaries, such as Charles Green, Edward Spencer, James Sadler, and Richard Gibson, but Margaret Graham was Mrs. Graham, the only English female aeronaut. Now, she did have a couple of bumps in her time, one of the most infamous crashes she ever had, the 22nd of August, 1836. Now, she ascended the tea gardens in Bayswater, other sources say the Flora Gardens, with a very important passenger. This was the Duke of Brunswick, but unfortunately, he nearly killed her. Now, what allegedly happened was this. Margaret Graham, throughout the course of the flight, they'd taken off at Tea Gardens in Bayswater, and the aim or their final destination was Brentford in Essex. It was a five-hour flight. And during the course of the flight, Margaret kept repeatedly asking the Duke, are you okay? Are you comfortable? Is everything all right? And he kept repeatedly saying, yes, it was fine. Things changed, just as they were about to descend. Um, it, turns that the, it turns out that the Duke was not, in fact, okay, and something gave him the heebie-jeebies, and he decided, as they were about to come into the ground, to leap out of the air balloon. <laughs> now, what happened during this time was that, of course, of course, this created a huge imbalance in weight in the basket. So as he threw himself out of the basket onto the ground, the disbalance of weight resulted in the balloon flying back up in the air like an elastic band, with poor old Margaret being thrown over the side, holding on for dear life. Now, there's a wonderful painting. It's currently hanging in the Stephen F. Advar Hazy Centre, which is part of the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum in Chantilly, Virginia. And they have a wonderful ship scene, a nautical scene, out, completely out of place in the background. There's a tiny little air balloon floating around mm -hmm. in the background. And on the reverse of the painting, in a typed note, it says, Owing to a bad landing, probably due to the premature alighting of the Duke, <laughs> Mrs. Graham was thrown out of the car and severely injured. She herself claimed that the fall was of a thousand feet and that her dress acted as a parachute and thus saved her life. <laughs> Margaret Graham was prone to slight exaggeration, I'll be honest, based on the accounts that I have read of hers and some of the things that she's put in as being fact. She, as I say, she was a fantastic self-publicist. An account that is probably more likely, it was closer to a hundred feet, but still, the unfortunate part... It's a ten-story building. A hundred feet is a ten-story building. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. I didn't yeah. know that. Yeah, bloody hell. It's ten feet a story, so it's a hundred so feet is a ten-story building she had to fall from. Damn. Right. Oh, okay. <laughs> oh, that's what I think of him too. Um, basically, in short, the horrible side of the story is that poor old Margaret ended up losing the child she was carrying as a result of this horrible landing, and she was kept up in bed for about two or three weeks in a farmhouse in Essex. Now, all while this happened, the Duke of, Br of Brunswick apparently had come back because he seemed to be more concerned with retrieving his, you know, long red cloak and his eyeglass that he'd had during the flight, which he'd lost when he'd jumped out of the car. <laughs> so um, she, of course, fired off a letter to the press. And, of course, this resulted in a... It was kind of the equivalent of a, a newspaper Twitter spat, such as it was back in the 1830s. So, anyway, um, Margaret, this did not stop her. She recovered very swiftly from her accident. And soon, before you knew it, she was back in the skies again, flying her balloon around. Now, she got a lot of flack for taking her kids up in the air. She had a number of daughters some of whom she taught how to fly balloons too. And this was one of the criticisms levelled against her. Apparently she was a terrible mother for daring to take her children into such dangerous ground and teach them, you know, how dare she teach them how to fly? <laughs> how dare she teach them independence? It was disgusting. Anyway, in 1850 she had another close call, again in August. This time the balloon exploded on a very hard landing and she was severely burned. And in fact, one of the cemetery's old managers apparently claimed that the family members of Margaret had actually come in with a photograph of her, and on her face she was covered in scars from this particular, mm. la this particular landing. You can actually find illustrations online of artist depictions of this very dramatic scene of the balloon exploding and all the gases and everything else. Now, she was very famous for her near misses. Um, unfortunately, she did have a couple of other ones that made the press. But she thrived on that kind of danger. She thrived on that kind of excitement. And I can't help but wondering if she was sort of a, you know, early to mid-Victorian adrenaline junkie, which oh, I think she clearly was. I think this is kind of evidence is everything. But anyway, um, in 1851, she ascended Mr. and Mrs. G. Batty's Hippodrome near Kensington with her husband. 
The balloon shot up and down as the gas escaped and they sped towards Crystal Palace and then Green Park, over the roofs, and unfortunately at this point she got snagged on a chimney top and got trapped. The pair dropped onto the roof and were severely hurt. So now, despite all of these accidents and run-ins with danger and near death that she experienced, and believe it or not, Margaret Graham died peacefully in her own bed, surrounded by her family at a ripe old age. She died in 1864. An obituary in the Sydney Empire on the 21st of November 1864 said, Margaret Graham at her residence at 109 Lower Thames Street. Mrs. Margaret Graham, the celebrated aeronaut, wife of George William Graham in the 61st year of her age. Her remains will be interred in Abney Park Cemetery. She is in a common grave. So just as a point of reference, if you are wondering where she is, she actually doesn't have a headstone. Her remains were uncovered by the Abney on Earth Project, for which Romani and I are incredibly grateful. Without them, we wouldn't have half a tour, to tell you the truth. Hopefully, hopefully, she will be getting a monument of her own, which symbolises her courage and her love of hot air balloons. So now that we're heading to the grave of Georgiana Pashley, this is the second row of graves back from the path, and the grave is a white stone square pillar with a pointed crown topper. Georgiana Pashley was born Georgiana Eagle in 1834. She is Abney's famous wizard queen and mesmerist. She grew up in the craft, as her father was also a stage magician, who billed himself as both the Royal Wizard of the South and the Napoleon of Wizards. However, his friends just knew him as Barney Eagle, the publican from Shoreditch. Despite his grandiose stage names, theater historians rate him as a minor performer, doing ordinary tricks in an ordinary way. However, Barney was very skilled at something we would now call marketing. Barney's wife died when Georgiana was eight years old, and while the rest of her siblings went off to live with their grandparents, Georgiana stayed with her father. Mesmerism had been popular since the 18th century, but Barney put a more theatrical spin on it by having his young daughter Georgiana as the star, billed as, quote, the second-sighted child and enchanted little lady. Her act involved both mesmerism and clairvoyance. And it probably helped, too, that, according to one observer, she was, quote, a good-looking girl. Georgiana and her father went on to tour with their act right up until his death. In fact, he actually died on stage, but more on that later. One of her tricks was to tell time by a watch held by a member in the audience while she remained blindfolded on stage. A watch would feature prominently in her legacy. In 1846, Georgiana was supposedly presented with an inscribed watch from Queen Victoria herself. The watch was nicknamed Vicky's Ticker and was displayed at the College of Psychic Studies in London until it was stolen in 1962. It was claimed that the watch was proof that Queen Victoria was interested in spiritualism to the extent that she participated in seances and consulted mediums. There were two inscriptions on the watch. One was to Miss Georgiana Eagle in 1846, supposedly from Queen Victoria. And the second engraving was much later. It wasn't until 1911. And that was to a Mrs. Edda Wright, who is said to have used the watch to summon the voice of Queen Victoria herself. One odd thing about the watch's inscription to Miss Georgiana is that it's misspelled. Queen Victoria apparently forgot that there is an E in Osborne House. This doesn't bode well for its veracity. For many years, researchers were unable to establish the identity of Georgiana Eagle, and it was believed that she was nothing more than a myth or just a story to go with this otherwise quite already fanciful watch. But this was because they were misled by several false assumptions. So the first was to assume that she was an adult medium older than the young Queen Victoria, when in fact she was 15 years younger than the Queen. Because of this, researchers were looking for proof of her existence much earlier in the century than was appropriate. And the second misunderstanding, and most bizarrely of all, researchers seemed to not consider that Miss Eagle would have used a stage name. So by looking for the wrong person at the wrong time, they could not, for instance, recognize, quote, the mysterious lady or Madame Gillian Card as being those of the same clairvoyant who was recorded on the watch. So it was thought the watch was just a fanciful imagining and Miss Eagle didn't exist. And the watch may or may not be a hoax, but Miss Georgiana Eagle did exist. She's right here, and she was certainly alive in 1846. However, the date inscribed on the gold watch, she was just 11 years old, and it's a rather bold claim that she was summoned by the Queen. In 1858, when Georgiana was 24 years old, her father, the Royal Wizard of the South, Napoleon of Wizards and owner of pub, died on stage during their act. He ruptured a large blood vessel by his liver, and the quantity of blood on stage was said to have been so great that people feared he would die instantly. He did, however, manage to make it to the hospital before he died, but reports of the time still reported dramatically that he died on stage, and that he very practically did. I think he would have appreciated the heightened drama of the reporting of his last performance. Less than three months after her father's death, Georgiana married reporter and photographer Charles Card. Over the following decade, there is a notable lack of any record regarding Georgiana's activities. 
Now, it's possible that she failed to capitalize on her father's name or notoriety and left the touring business, or perhaps her husband insisted she remained home. We don't know. However, in 1867, her life changed course again because her husband died, and now she was a widow. Freedom! Yay! But then probably married Alfred George Joseph Aloysius Gilliard which would make a stupendous stage name, but he didn't use it. Gillian was a professor of music who was to become her manager and agent when she returned to the stage. She appeared in public again in about 1872 at the age of 38, this time as Madame Gillian Card, billed now as the world-famous wizard queen, humorist, and mesmerist. In that year, she performed at the Royal Agricultural Hall in London, giving her, quote, novel and renowned magical, comical, musical, and sensational mesmeric entertainment with her second husband as the supporting act, who was billed as the musical phenomenon, vocal comedian, and versatile, grotesque instrumentalist. I will leave that to you to envision for yourselves. After her second husband died, this is a theme, Georgiana married a third time in 1888, this time to a man who was 25 years younger and they remained married until her death. Georgiana was buried on the 10th of March, 1911, at the age of 76, right here with her second husband, Alfred Gilliand, who was buried her 29 years previously in 1882. And Lord knows what her third husband thought of that, but she strikes me as a woman who just did what she liked. Now, with the death of our wizard queen, that brings us to the end of our tour. Thank you very much for joining us today. And there is much more to explore in Abney Park if you stop by the visitor center to say hi and pick up some leaflets or peruse the bookshop. And there are more audio walks through Abney Park and around the rest of London that are all available to take for free on my personal SoundCloud page just under Romany Reagan. Ladies and gentlemen, thank you ever so much for joining us this lovely day, walking through Abney Park Cemetery. Thank you so much for your kind attention. We hope you've enjoyed the selection of women that we've had. One thing, that a continual theme that has struck me about all of these women is that they in some way, shape or form basically defied the odds and gave a two-fingered salute to society that expected them to be one way or the other and uh, just did as they pleased, as Romney said. And um, yeah, that's one of the things I love about Abney Park. There's definitely a, very much a spirit of punk rock involved in a lot of the people there who kind of stuck two fingers up to society and said, you know what, we'll do it our way. Absolutely. And as, as the old adage goes, well-behaved women rarely make history. And we are going to continue history by celebrating these women. Go forth and conquer. Go forth and do what you want. Go forth and vote. Oh. Romani, there's another question. Um, it says here, is Betsy's headstone near the site of her common grave or was it erected in a different spot? No, it's on It's on the site of the common grave. Yeah, it's definitely the same location. Um, but no, that, that's the next question. Hang on, and there's more. Um, are there moves to get Margaret Graham a memorial? Um, that's, it is a good question. It's something I would love to see her have because, you know, I think for all of the times that she was uh, basically publicizing herself in the media, I think there's nothing more that, that she than she'd like than having a memorial to her name. I, I, I don't know if there are plans afoot to get something like that done, but uh, personally, I'd love to see that happen. Oh, yeah, do we, that's the thing is this is actually, this tour when we give it live is almost two hours and no one needs that on Zoom. So we had to make some very judicious um, cutting of our, of our lovely ladies. Um, so it's much shorter in this version. We just mm -hmm. gave a little sort of sampler platter. Also a teaser for when we start doing live tours again, um, we, we can still have people to celebrate in the space. So yeah, this was very much a, a shortened uh, version. Yeah, um, just, just to follow on from that, that particular question, um, as I was saying to Romany and Zach and Hayden earlier on this evening, Something that I found, and I feel very fortunate to take tours at Abney because there are so many incredible women, and um, you know, I just we just keep finding them. <laughs> um, I found another two fantastic women who we'd like to include on the tour. I mean, we're up to a list of about what must be must be about eighteen now, Romany. Yeah, twenty. Awesome. I mean, it's almost it's incredibly difficult to try and condense into a tour of you know a walking tour of two hours. Um, so yeah, hopefully in the future. It's not so much about cutting people off intentionally or excluding from the mature. It's more of a, on a practical level that we simply can't include everybody. But as I propose to Romani, perhaps, you know, maybe next year, what would be nice is to perhaps shuffle the, our lovely ladies around so that, you know, the woman we've covered extensively can, um, you know, take a back seat and let some of the other wonderful women who we've recently researched shine and come to the fore. So, yeah, um, hopefully when we do this tour again next, there will be some 
extra amazing woman who we will we'll have added on to the talk and um, yeah. we'll hope you'll find super interesting. Because also there's over 200,000 people buried there. So it's like there's, you know, and even then so many of the lovely stories are really hard to tease out from the archive. Because I mean, one of the reasons why we do the, the, the women of dot 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 tours is because those stories are not that prominent in, in the archive like their male um, contemporaries are. Um, and also someone just asked if you could give the book details again, please, I think. Is that for, oh, the, that's for the Hackney Society book. Um, oh, and is there a guide? There's also, I know that um, London Month of the Dead, um, that's also now rebranding uh, is London City of the Dead. Um, we're also working up a sort of guide in conjunction with them that will have a map component. Mm -hmm. And um, if you would, and that has the, that's a longer version of this tour that has more women featured on it. Um, that's something that if anyone's interested, check the London Month of the Dead website for that should be coming out in, I don't know when, but in the coming month or so, I reckon. Uh, if you want like a physical sort of map version and more of a, that aspect. Um, that's oh, there's a question here. Why did she not get her name on the headstone? Um, Eva, was that in reference to Ethel Haslam? Ah, yes, yes, it was. Um, I don't rightly know. Um, Break it. Sorry? Well, it wasn't it for retribution? Because they, they were worried about people defiling the headstone or something? I thought it was... Um, that, sure. that is definitely a possibility. Although, um, you know, with her parents being buried there, I can't imagine, given her parents were, you know, very supportive of her activities, I can't imagine why they would have had any objection to having her name not inscribed. I mean, oh. it's entirely possible it could have been for a financial reason. I don't know, actually. It's something I'm really curious to look into as to why that is. It's a work in progress, ladies and gents, let's put it that way. Um, just in, yeah, in response to Hayden, could be a family timing thing, Re Ethel. Um, I mean, it is it is possible. I mean, maybe it was just I, I don't I can't imagine why she wouldn't have wanted her name on a headstone. Although something that's very curious about Ethel is that um, perhaps I was looking in the wrong places. But my sources for obituaries and other such things when people pass away is the British Newspaper Archive, and for some unknown reason, I wasn't able to find a single solitary obituary about her which I thought, frankly, considering her activities and that she continued with a lot of social justice activities well after her time within the suffragettes, you would have thought that she would have been noted, um, you know, or people would have noted when her funeral was. But if anybody can find something on that, please feel free to share it with the trust, because to date, I haven't had very much luck on the British newspaper archive anyway. In fact, I found a significantly lack thereof in terms of obituaries about her actual passing and internment in Abney Park, which I thought was really weird. So if anybody has come across anything like that that they'd care to share with us, I'd be incredibly grateful. And um, ditto if we do this tour, when we do this tour again, I should say. Um, yeah, hopefully we'll have more information about that. Does anybody else? Have Sorry. That looks to be it. Unless someone's got a last minute thought. I can't wait until we can start doing these things live again. Presumably yes. we're going to get to that. <laughs> you know, yeah. I'm, I, was, I was just saying to Romani and Zach, and, oh, sorry. Sorry, no, yeah, it's, all, it's, yeah, it's just it's not, not the same when we don't have the, the actual stones and the actual walking in the space that has, you know, but yeah. Gosh, yeah, sorry, I was just saying to uh, Romani and Zach and Hayden earlier how much I actually really miss taking actual cemetery tours. Like, the live events are wonderful and it's lovely to see everybody, but I think there is a certain atmosphere that you have wandering around Abney. And um, as, as Romney rightly said, you know, you get to see the person's headstone, or in the case of Margaret Graham, non-headstone in front of you. And I think that's also, um, I think it establishes a greater connection between the person you're talking about to the person, people you're talking to, if that makes sense. Yeah. Well, there is an element of that that I really, really do miss, and I can't wait to take people out again. Um, okay. Hopefully, we'll see you all as soon as we're allowed to do this. Um, yeah, bring it on. <laughs> in answer to, to your question, uh, Mel, about my favorite woman, Barry Namney, I, for me, I would probably say Betsy. But also because she, I love the manifestation of the, just the idea that just because someone doesn't have a glamorous headstone 
when they're interred doesn't mean they aren't an incredibly important person buried in the cemetery. And I think, you know, the idea that some of the most fascinating people like Margaret Graham or Betsy before her lovely stone were unmarked. And that's another, another aspect is the most flashy stone, probably the least interesting person really. <laughs> You know, Romani, I'm so, so glad you mentioned that because I had exactly that thought the other day, constantly thinking about cemeteries as one does. Um, sometimes it's easy to pass a headstone in the blink of an eye and forget about it, not recognizing that there's an amazing story underneath it. And as you quite rightly said, sometimes the ground of the monument, I think perhaps maybe people made up the fact that their lives weren't that exciting by having something more attention grabbing and death. I don't know. But, um, you know, I mean, um, personally, one of my favorite women buried in um, Abney Park is Mary Hayes. She was a feminist writer who was a very close friend with Mary Wollstonecraft. And she was very much a woman who did as she pleased and bucked every convention that was expected of her in the 18th century. She was actually a Georgian as opposed to a Victorian. And um, yeah, uh, she, she's absolutely fantastic. And she just did everything her way and did as she pleased. And I absolutely adore it. The problem is yeah, it's hard to pick just one extraordinary woman because Abney's full of them. We have the most incredible, um, we, I say it like I'm part of the cemetery as it were, but um, I have the most incredible selection of the most fantastic woman of depth and character and talent. And it's, it's very difficult to pick just one, I think. Um, I think there's one more question here, Romani. Um, do you have audio tours for lockdown? But I think that's something you may have actually covered on the tour. I'm just trying to get a link. I was navigating my various bits. Hang on. Um, there's there's audio. There's links to audio tours on the um, on the Abney Park website, and then there's also more on my personal SoundCloud page. And these are some that were in the cemetery, but also in Tower Hamlet Cemetery, and some around us bases in London as well. And they're all free, so you can just take a wander one day in our lockdown lives. <laughs> Right. Does anybody have anything else to ask? Cool. Yes, that'd be thank you ever so much, everybody. Um, yeah, thank you, everyone. Yeah, this is the first time I've done a virtual tour, and it's, it was both terrifying and exhilarating in equal measure. It was, it was an enormous amount of fun to do, and it was um, lovely to see you all. Thank you ever so much for coming and supporting the Trust um, and supporting the Autumn Woman on International Women's Day. Thanks, everyone. Have a lovely evening. <laughs> okay.